So welcome to another edition of Edison TV. My name is Puya Hamami. I'm a senior healthcare analyst here at Edison. Today, it is our pleasure to speak again with Stephen Gorley, the CEO of Actinogen Medical, a company developing novel treatments for Alzheimer's disease and, and cognitive disorders. Thank you for joining us again, Stephen. Uh, thanks, Puya. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So as we start off, please provide us a quick reminder of how Xanamem works and how its mechanism of action of targeting cortisol differs from other approaches that are used to treat memory loss and Alzheimer's disease. Xanamem is a unique molecule in that it's a tissue cortisol synthesis inhibitor. And what that means is it is a way of reducing the levels of cortisone, cortisol in tissue, which uh, acts on various different receptors inside and outside cells. And it leaves essential levels of cortisol intact and normal in the blood and the rest of the body. Okay. And so what are the potential benefits of an oral drug like Xanamem compared to some of the anti-amyloid biologic drugs for Alzheimer's disease, which have garnered a lot of attention, such as Lakembi? In particular, what has been shown so far in terms of the safety of Xanamem, given that it's already completed three placebo-controlled trials? Yes, so, you know, the new anti-amyloid intravenous infusions are an interesting development for the field. The clinical benefit of those uh, is modest, but definitely real um, because it's been replicated multiple times. Uh, however, the safety is concerning because it caused those cause brain swelling and sometimes bleeding and the occasional death. Uh, so Xanamem with 300 people or more treated so far has been shown to be very safe. Um, we've also shown good signs of activity and effectiveness on cognition and potentially disease modifying effect in patients with mild Alzheimer's as well. So the, the differentiating points for our oral molecule is that first of all, it's easy to take, convenient. Uh, it doesn't need complicated monitoring like the intravenous infusions do. And its safety at this point uh, looks uh, very good. Okay, very exciting. And, and of course, the next major catalyst that you know we've been looking for is the start of the phase 2B portion of the Xanamia study which assesses Xanamem and Alzheimer's disease. And just maybe give us a reminder of what led to the, the type of biomarker testing that led to intriguing subset data in a prior Xanadu study in Alzheimer's patients and how this current study, the phase 2B, is designed to show a differentiated treatment effect in patients screened for an elevated P-Tower biomarker. Yes. So we were very excited to see that in biomarker positive patients, particularly this biomarker called PTAL in the blood, um, which reflects sort of advancing progression of, of tau and amyloid protein in the brain of patients with Alzheimer's disease. So in biomarker positive patients, we saw a big clinical effect of Xanamem uh, to reduce progression potentially over a 12 week period, much greater than any other drug has ever shown before. Now that was in a relatively small sample of patients um, and it needs to be repeated in this phase 2B. But as you said, we're excited to be starting this study. We've, we've, we've already completed most of the feasibility and uh, really the study is essentially starting at the moment. Uh, and we hope to enroll our first patient before the end of the year. And uh, that study will have results in 2025. Okay, so it's gonna be starting before the end of this, this year. And so what are some of the efficacy endpoints that will be used in the study? In particular, I think um, that it, that the main endpoint, the primary endpoint, is a cognitive cognitive a cognitive composite endpoint rather than the CDRSB scale that was used to support the FDA appro approval applications of Lakembi and Adderhelm. So, what are the potential benefits of using a cognitive composite endpoint in this stage? Sure. So, um, we've chosen this endpoint because we believe it's the best and most likely to fully reflect the, the, the benefit of Xanamem in patients uh, with elevated PTAL and Alzheimer's disease. Um, so other companies have certainly used composites before, so we're not the, we're not the first one to do this. Uh, Lily, for example, use a composite. They don't use CDR summer boxes as their primary uh, for their Dynamam program, uh, whereas Lakembi uh, certainly did use CDR summer boxes. We will measure CDR summer boxes as well, along with an activity of daily living scale called the Amsterdam ADL scale, which uh, will, so there are three important endpoints in the trial. The cognitive composite, which measures how well you think, remember, and solve problems. 
And that reflects the positive data we've seen in those endpoints in previous trials already and healthy older volunteers, and to a certain extent in patients with mild Alzheimer's. And then we'll also do CDR summer boxes and the activities of daily living scale. So we'll have a very complete set of assessments in these patients. Okay. And will the study help provide any insight as to whether Xanamem can itself actually have disease modifying effects, meaning can it actually change the course of the disease itself? In our 12-week study, uh, which is relatively short, we did see in mild patients uh, that pretty big clinical effect to dramatically slow uh, progression in over that 12-week period. If that was confirmed, uh, it would it would in the, this new study over nine months, we would actually be fairly sure that Xanamem does have disease modifying ability. So at the moment we're saying it's disease course modifying. Uh, but certainly in, a, in animal models where you inhibit this enzyme and reduce tissue cortisol in, in Alzheimer's mice, you see a, a cognitive protection while amyloid continues to be laid down uh, over a 13-month period. So the preclinical evidence suggests that it is disease-modifying, and our first clinical data suggests it may well be as well. Okay. And how many patients... Do you expect to enroll in the phase 2b study and i think you mentioned you uh, plan to report data i did at 25. Um, is there also an interim data readout that can provide investors with an overview of how the study is proceeding yes we are including an interim analysis hopefully in the earlier part of 2025 uh, that will uh, give investors some uh, comfort that the study is progressing and is is uh, is showing promise the exact details of that will be released uh, in due course. Interim analyses are quite technical from a statistical point of view, and it's very important to get them right, because one of the things would be that if this study is doing really well uh, and potentially could be regarded by the FDA as a pivotal study to help get, get the drug approved earlier, you don't want to blow that by doing an interim analysis that sort of the FDA doesn't like and says you can't really use the study in that way. So we will carefully consider all of that. But yes, there will be an informative interim analysis. Overall, we're planning to enroll 330 patients uh, and treat them for nine months. Uh, and that is a, a pretty generous sized uh, look at the efficacy of Xanamem versus placebo. And geographically, which countries are being involved with this study? And are there any particularly prominent sites or, or studies research groups that are involved in the trial? As an Australian company, we uh, always uh, use Australia as our home base. That's also because we get a very generous 48.5% tax credit as a cash rebate for Australian activities. And some of, we can include some overseas activities as well. Um, so we plan to start in Australia and expand out to the US, UK, and probably Singapore and South Korea as well. And so um, we have a number of esteemed uh, investigators and advisors around the world involved in the program. Uh, Professor Chris Chen in Singapore, for example, is, uh, has been involved in the field for a long, long time. Uh, and there are a number of uh, investigative sites in the US and Australia that have worked with Actinogen in the past. Uh, Professor Michael Woodward in Melbourne at the Austin Hospital uh, will be one of the sites in the trial. And as, as I guess we highlighted earlier, Xanamem could, could potentially be a once daily oral drug with, with a different mechanism of action compared to the anti-amyloids. So with that consideration, how do you see the drug fitting in clinical use settings if it does become approved? In other words, could it potentially be used alongside other drugs for Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, that's a great question. So we've, we obviously look at potential for other drugs and combinations. One of the great things about our program so far is lots of patients have been treated with Xanamem in combination with their usual anti-blood pressure medications or anti-cholesterol medications. All of that has been safe. It's been used in combination with Aricept, the old-fashioned uh, Pfizer drug to, to improve memory in patients with Alzheimer's. So we know it's safe in combination. So we're not worried about combination therapy. That's a, that's a, that's a given. But we are developing this drug as a potential first-line therapy because if our data so far proved to be true in a larger uh, and longer trial, it will have a much greater clinical effect and be considerably safer than any other drug we know of today uh, for this condition for Alzheimer's disease. So um, potentially we think it's uh, a first-line therapy, um, but could be used in combination. 
Well, it seems very exciting, the whole uh, notion of, uh, of an improved treatment for Alzheimer's because it is such a dramatic, a devastating condition for many individuals. And there's a definite unbelievable need for new therapies. But again, for, for um, actinogen, um, while Alzheimer's is the lead indication, you're also studying other indications, mainly there's a current study involved right now, the Zana CIDD study in patients with cognitive impairment due to major depressive disorder. So how large itself is the market for cognitive impairment as it relates to depression? And what considerations led the company to pursue this indication as well? Yeah, so the market for depression is very large and cognitive impairment or foggy thinking and depression is very is more common than not. So if you think about a depression being a $10 billion market, cognition in depression um, is some, you know, in the order of three to half that three to five billion dollars. Now there is a drug called vortioxetine that doesn't, it has some information on cognitive benefits in its label. Uh, and it has sales of about 500 million US annually a year, just to give you a bit of an idea. So um, by addressing th this foggy thinking aspect of depression, uh, as well as depression itself, because of, uh, an 11 beta HSD1 inhibitor in theory is an excellent mechanism by which you would address both cognition and depression. So in this study we're doing with 160 people, uh, hopefully by the middle of next year, we'll have results showing that the drug improves cognition and in depression as well. Now, as it relates to the study itself, the Zena CADD study, um, I believe that you're uh, you're adding some U.S. sites, and there have been some uh, some consideration with some of the U.K. sites. So maybe just give us a bit of an update on how this the study is progressing so far. Yeah, well, look, we'll probably give an enrollment update uh, soon, but uh, we last reported that it was more than uh, twenty five percent enrolled, and that it, uh, like and that enrollment in Australia was accelerating. Um, we were a bit uh, flummoxed by the UK, which normally turns uh, a trial approval around in one or two months, but uh, it took more than six months for the UK to give us an approval, which apparently was an industry-wide delay that they had. Anyway, we do have now the approval. The UK didn't, they didn't change the protocol at all. Um, similarly, we've filed an IND with the US um, uh, uh, to open some US sites. So the addition of the US and the UK sites will supplement the Australian enrollment. And at this stage, we're very much on track for having the results by the middle of next year. So which is not very far away. Okay, that's great. That's great. And, and so with the results expected in the middle of next year, what would be the next steps perhaps for depression related indication if the data is positive then? Yeah, with a, with a positive phase two study, uh, that would lead us to an end of phase two discussion with the, the division at the FDA initially, and possibly with the European agency uh, to agree on the design of phase three studies and a phase three program would commence as soon as we could, either alone um, as Action Engine or, or with uh, one or more partners. So, so in closing, what are some of the major catalysts for actinogen and xanamib that we should expect to hear for our, over the next 12 to 24 months? So the next uh, big catalyst, is, as you said, is really the, you know, the, the full initiation of first patient enrolled in the, in the xanamib phase 2b study of patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we're well on the way to achieving that. Uh, that's likely to be uh, towards the end of this year. Uh, the next big catalyst will be the results of the depression and cognition study um, before the middle of next year. And then the next um, endpoint, hopefully not more than about nine months later, would be the interim analysis for the Xanamia phase 2b study uh, at the beginning of 2025. So, uh, you know, we have three major uh, clinical uh, time points there. Um, in a relatively short period of time. So we're excited to get on, make all of that happen, and uh, hopefully bring incredibly good results uh, forward for patients and, uh, and our shareholders as well. Well, it sounds like a very exciting time for Actinogen. And so thank you very much for the update, Stephen. And we look forward to following up on the company's progress and on catching up with you again shortly. Thanks very much.